Hey, everybody, welcome in. Happy Sunday. Thank you for the likes. Thank you to the moderators in the chat and everybody else. Yes, the markets still suck, but that's okay. This is the time we can use to learn and stack. So with that, let's jump in. Make sure. So with can. that, yeah, I test my video. Big thank you, Mr. Whammers. <laughs> in fact, Mr. Whammers, thank you so much as well. You helped us avoid a donation scam. So big thank you to you too. So let's jump in. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. 45 learnings plus more at the end. But as usual, this is edutainment. This is not financial advice. And we're going to start with a question that I was stumped with by one Brydom last Sunday. And I always get to the questions if I can't answer them. And it was a little bit difficult because one Brydom asked, if Bitcoin goes to 158,000 by 2024, what would you estimate Sol to be in the same time frame? So I know exactly how to compare Sol to Ethereum, but that extra step of Bitcoin to Sol, I wanted to make sure I gave you the right information. So here we are. And remember, everybody, this is not financial advice. This is a hypothetical study of one of the many ways in which I price things out. So big thank you again from last week. This is the answer to the question, just using one hypothetical model. Now, if we take the Bitcoin price, and the Bitcoin price currently is 19690 and there are 19 million in circulation. Coin market cap, which is what I use as the dominance model for this, the future price goes to 158. That is a 7x from here. Now, for Ethereum, what I do is I staggered it. I compare, because part of my thesis for Solana price prediction is a function of the percentage of value of market cap of Ethereum. So what I did was I compared the Bitcoin price to the Ethereum dominance in the future, which I believe will be at least 25%. And that will bring us to an Ethereum price, hypothetically, of 15,450 if Bitcoin goes to 158,000. If Bitcoin doesn't go to 158,000, that 15,000 price target for Ethereum goes away. And that is a function of the scarcity, the deflationary nature of Ethereum. ETH in proof of stake, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are two variations for the Solana price. One is 10% of ETH dominance, and the second one is 20% of ETH dominance. So if we assume that although Solana handles a lot more than ETH right now, but if you add in the layer twos, it's a different situation, that would take us with 10% ETH market cap, it would take us to $370 a token, which is exactly, coincidentally, and I didn't make this up, a 1,020% or 10x from here uh, in terms of price. And if we go to Solana being worth 20% of Ethereum's market cap, that would take us to $739 or about a 21x from here. So with that, that is the answer to your question. Remember, uh, the simple way to think about it is if Bitcoin does a 7x per that model, Ethereum will do a 10x and all the way down the line, and I have it here further at the risk curve, Solana could theoretically do a 20x from here. I still do believe mathematically and on a comparative basis, Solana is very undervalued. That's why I have it out to the right because that also signifies the risk curve. It is riskier, but the more risk, the more return. Seven, 10, 20. I look forward to coming back here in about three years and seeing how close we are. So with that, Again, just, just numbers, nothing else. And of course, any of these chains could break or destroy and be worth nothing. We don't know. That's the risk we take. So next question uh, from Dr. TSPC. Can you explain why MicroStrategy and Bitcoin don't move in lockstep even when there is no MicroStrategy news? Great question. And it's a big part of how we like to play here. So first of all, there are a number of possible reasons. And uh, I'll go through the short list. Um, first... Most people have no idea how to value microstrategy. Uh, people are not sure about the financial, financial risk of microstrategy, i.e. the debt load they hold. Uh, there is a large short interest. Uh, the news cycle uh, can be driven, for example, a topic like tax and sailor can affect the price of microstrategy. Market correlations and fluctuations impacted. So if the S&P 500 tanks and Bitcoin stays stable, microstrategy will tank too. And there is no arbitrage mechanism to ensure a microstrategy share price stays in line with the value of Bitcoin. However, we have built a model for that, which 
we share within the community on Patreon. So with that, let's look at the chart. Now, the most important chart to look at is the pair. This is the MicroStrategy to Bitcoin pair. Since August 11, 2020, that's when they first started buying Bitcoin. And the blue line is the pair price. The red line is the 200-day moving average. And the green line is the 50-day moving average. Now, if you look at this carefully, it's like, huh? How come the blue line fluctuates so much? And it's kind of like half the time above the 200 day, half the time below. Uh, how do we play it from here? Well, <laughs> the answer is as follows. So this is the kind of roadmap. And of course, hindsight is always 2020, but you can pull a lot of stuff from this actual pair. First of all, green is typically when you get, go long and when it becomes completely overbought. And that happened in early 2021. Then it can tank. <laughs> all the way down and become completely oversold and then overbought, oversold, overbought, oversold. And here we are right now. Uh, I did a detailed video as well on MicroStrategy and the dilution selling $500 million in equity to buy Bitcoin and what it actually means for investors. And check out that video. I'll put it here. Uh, you can watch it after the show if you want to see exactly how you can play it. So for me, it's a perfect trade. It's pretty easy to identify when things are overbought or oversold and you adjust accordingly. And I'm currently in a short on MicroStrategy right now, but I still have in the money long positions out to 2024. So that is how I play the game. Next question is from Ox Lighthouse. You once mentioned that most gains are made in the first few hours of trading. What is your pre-market routine to set up for a successful day? Well, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. First of all, you got to know what's going on in the market. You got to read a lot to get the pulse and where it's going to go. Do a lot of stuff pre-market before the market opens. So typically uh, where I am, market opens at 6.30 a.m. So you need to be in the chair looking at stuff kind of 5.30 in the morning. But this is uh, probably one of the most valuable videos I've ever done. It's a two-part series. I interviewed Larry Williams, who is a legend, for two hours. Um, we shared... Part one uh, was watched about 40,000 times in the last three days. Part two hasn't been watched at all. And all the nuggets are in part two. So if anybody's interested in learning 90 years of knowledge in a quick 35 minutes, check out part two. And we cover things like how to time trades and stuff as well. So lessons from a legend. We'll put the link here too. I'm beginning to feel like Guy from Coin Bureau <laughs> with all the links, but it's important to catch up. And I notice a lot of people, sometimes they miss a video and that can be very important. Uh, some of the some of the videos are really critical, and I don't care if you watch it or not. But there is so much in that that everybody needs to know. So back to your question, market hours. First of all, I like to buy the open and sell the close. So what that means is, if I can, I like to buy in pre-market, snag things before the move happens. All the action typically for me in equities not crypto, because crypto is 24-7 equities, tends to be within the first hour and normally before it even opens. And right as well, uh, watching a lot of macro and metrics, sometimes things run towards the end and that's where I kind of sell or get into positions. So if anybody has been watching kind of my trades, you will see I do a lot of selling right before the close, sometimes within 15 minutes before the market's close. Now, all of this depends on market conditions. It depends on strength follow through into the next day. It also depends on what's going to happen. So for example, before an earnings report, if I feel really bullish about an earnings report, I will get into a position that I'll go long because I believe it'll pop in the after hours. If I think everybody's bought the rumor, they're going to sell the news, then I'll go short. So, but the real secret here is the real fun is outside regular hours. And this is an analysis done of the action in regular hours and outside regular hours and most of the gains happen outside because that's where the pros play and the big money plays as well so uh use that with a grain of salt markets do change different markets are different forex is different to equities which is different to futures etc but that's how i play it great question and uh, next question is from will j ducks i am trying to stack a whole coin when the market recovers and gets toppy, would it be smart to sell the top even if I'm trying to stack as much Bitcoin as possible? Excellent question. So first of all, we all learned that HODL is not as lucrative by no stretch. And right now, 
I believe people should have a certain percentage of HODL. Stuff that you stick away and you keep for a rainy day, you build that position. And a certain percentage should be used for swing trading and scalp trading. That's what I do. Um, but also, it's very, very important to watch for seasonality. You don't want to sell out of your Bitcoin right before the Bitcoin halving because you know the price is going to run after that. And that's why the first question was very interesting because it was out to 2024, which is the time of the halving. Now, also watch for the price action and FIB levels. Things can be short term overbought and oversold. And don't get yourself into a big tax situation. Watch for wash sale rules, etc. Very, very important. But sometimes um, my big mistake was because of a big tax uh, debt last year, it prevented me from selling out of certain assets like Ethereum. You know, you could have sold it nearly 5K, cost basis of 200. And I didn't because I didn't want to pay the taxes. And that was a mistake. Remember, you never go broke paying taxes. But at the same time, keep all of that into perspective as you go. Think about what percentage of your whole coin you want to keep versus what you want to trade in and out of. Uh, that is the way to go forward now. Next question is from Jeff Hammer. Great question. Uh, what exchange can you buy Aptos and Sui on? I'm considering a nibble as I did a Solent. After all, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yeah, and again, for everybody to remember, the Solent video I did was how to buy an IDO. It was not a recommendation to buy Solent at all. So with that, um, Aptos and Sui, I did do a couple of videos on them at this stage. Everybody believes they are the Sol killers that are coming and they will be the top layer ones, but I am not so sure. So first of all, as a couple of things, uh, they are not available for purchase in the open market yet. Not sure when they will be. And I do not recommend purchasing them, even if they do come out. But it might be worth a flutter if they bounce really high, crash down, and then do a little dead cap bounce or something can come back. Maybe it's worth it. But remember, when you look at the performance of any other coin that raised a truckload of money back in the day, we had Algorand and ICP and EOS, uh, all heavily dominated by insiders and VCs. There is no money to be had. Check out the ICP chart for a rude awakening. Um, and also check about the allocations to insiders and VCs and unlocked periods. Now they can massively dump on retail. So, and also watch how they're listed on exchanges. Sometimes the exchanges can be in cahoots. So uh, net net, um, I think I wouldn't do it. Second of all, there's already a lawsuit against the Aptos CEO and a shout out to hat tip to my bed 54 who shared this. The Aptos CEO also worked at Facebook, has also apparently, apparently, allegedly, done some sketchy stuff in the past. And uh, apparently, according to this lawsuit, they have cheated somebody out of their equity uh, in the building of this particular Aptos firm. So, you know, a lot of people talk about crypto being equitable and fair and decentralized, etc. But no, according to this lawsuit, the same games exist here as they do everywhere else. So again, tarnished black eye out of the gate. In addition, sorry, Jeff, <laughs> long answer to your question. But in addition, uh, there are typically low, risk, low returns on VCs around at this stage of the game, especially with these astronomical valuations, $2 billion valuations. You know, you got big names that have been running for years very successfully. Um, like Matic is only trading at about 8 billion, Solana about 12 billion. So there's not a lot of upside considering uh, these guys already have most of the valuation. And finally, guess who makes the money? This is the guy and uh, full respect, of course, to Sam Bagman fried He gets in, er, in early, he gets in hard. And uh, maybe you want to bet alongside him, but I don't think you're going to get as much return as he will on this as well. He's the guy who gets the real alpha. So Stay away. If you want to throw a couple of bucks at it, why not? Time it right using TA, but do not <laughs> do not allocate any big position to it. Next question. Uh, this is uh, from Quantum Twist. And this is an interesting one. If you still lived in Europe, how would you position yourself to not get wiped out? I am in Germany and it's getting worse daily. So I feel bad for everybody back in Europe, especially in Germany with all the crap that's going on. So my heart bleeds for you all. But let's talk about what I would do. And I'm very big on kind of five-year plans and 10-year plans and always thinking ahead. So first, I would find a way, and, and I should say, sorry, this is not 
advice. Just your question is what I would do, and I'm answering it honestly as to what I would do. I would set up some type of perpetual income source in the home country, Germany, for example, in your case. I would find a way to own some real estate in your home country for that income generation. Uh, I'd have a little bit of Bitcoin if possible, get a little bit of Tesla, maybe some leading layer one, whatever. That's kind of how I'd set up my bag and investments. Then I would bounce. So if you look, uh, actually, this is an interesting chart because uh, everybody seems to be moving out of the countries beginning with the UK, like the UK and Ukraine, all the millionaires, that is, um, into places like Greece and Portugal and Switzerland. So people are moving from different places to different places. And I did an entire video on that. I'll put a link here as well if anybody's interested in seeing that. In addition, this is kind of what I would look for. And I'm putting together a map and I'm going to keep it updated and share it with you all. Maybe we can crowdsource it. But this is a little Google map I built. It's kind of the IA crypto friendly and tax free crypto map. And it's a place of finding a crypto friendly jurisdiction um, and also a place where crypto is tax free in some cases, one or the other or both in some cases. And I call this the new Bermuda Square. It's not the Bermuda Triangle, but you can see here it's got Bermuda, it's got Belarus, it's got the Bahamas, all the bees are in there. You've got the Cayman, Malta, Slovenia, Portugal, Switzerland, El Salvador, etc., etc. Lots of cool places to think about. Even Singapore is on there, but it wouldn't fit in my, my Bermuda Square. But uh, that's, that's where you can kind of consider where you're going as well going forward. Also, this is kind of uh, a lot of Europeans that I know. They have left certain places to move to different places. Portugal was very popular for a while. Uh, in fact, it's been popular for the last 20 years. France, Slovenia, Italy, who doesn't want to live in Como with our friend, I can't remember his name right now, uh, Montenegro, Thailand, Indonesia, Costa Rica, Vietnam. A lot of these places have good medical systems, very low cost of living, nice weather, etc. And people need that. But I also recommend security, medical system, and proximity to an airport in case you need to get back home fast. Very important to consider. And also, final thing, another long-winded answer, beware because incentives could change. And here, Portugal will close a legal loophole to start taxing cryptocurrencies, says its finance minister. Remember, every is looking for ways to reach more into your pocket as they go forward. US has just doubled its tax authorities, invested another $87 billion or hiring another 87,000 tax investigators. So watch uh, for places because legal frameworks can change. Everything can change. Uh, keep your tap dancing shoes on as well. You know, have backpack, can travel, etc., or whatever it is. So next question is from Decentra Suzy. Does the WEF, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset, make investing riskier if their intent is for us to own nothing and be happy? Will CBDCs become the only medium of exchange? And if so, control the purchasing of hard assets, potentially making crypto stocks worthless? Great question. So it's pretty, it's pretty stunning to me how open and direct uh, the WEF is with their plans over the next couple of years. And I don't know if it's going to be real or not, but it's definitely worth being concerned about. So, Susie, you've got the right questions. So first of all, Great Reset and CBDCs, it's all there for control. Um, and in fact, a lot of this stuff, if you came to me in November 2019 and asked me, is any of this ever possible? I'd say no. But what's happened since March 2020 to today and uh, makes me rethink everything that happens out there in the world and what governments are capable of, of lockdowns, of mandates, etc. I don't want to get too much down this rabbit hole, but everything is possible and it can be quite shocking. So the CBTCs with the Great Sister, the Great Reset will have control over how much you have, how much you make, how much you save, how much you spend what you can spend your money on and how you invest. And Bitcoin is one of those safety valves. And we'll talk more about how it can be as well real shortly. But it is pretty scary what they are trying to do and what they can force you to do. And that is why I personally am absolutely terrified of central bank digital currencies. And this is why I do believe Bitcoin is a potential escape valve from this system. Now, when you have guys like Nuriel Rubini come out and say, uh, talking up the idea that the Fed coin is going to replace Bitcoin. He hates Bitcoin, of course. And he thinks the central bank digital currency, the Fed coin will moon. It's going to do great. It's going to solve every problems. 
it is extremely terrifying. Uh, right now, there's a lot of news last week about the Federal Reserve and their central bank digital currency, the complete about face. But there isn't even a roadmap or a white paper at this point. And uh, years ago, the US government tried to launch a central health system. It was a complete failure. Websites didn't work. It was just a disaster. So CBDCs, uh, the way they control stuff, the way they can penalize stuff, the way there's a digital record around everything is absolutely terrible. And what they could do as actually, this is so bizarre, and I'll say this in confidence with the small little audience here. I had a nightmare last night that they had CBDCs turned on and they turned off all of the public websites that showed how much money printing was happening. And I felt naked and alone. I had no data to look at. It was very, very scary times. That's the type of nightmare that I have. It's kind of weird. But we could no longer see what's happening behind the scenes, what governments are doing with money, with this whole new CBDC. So it's kind of scary times indeed. And we have now a related question. It's going to come up in a little bit back to this topic. So hold on a second. We're going to deal with one more from Double Decker. And this is an interesting one too, because I have another inside story regarding this one. My new employer will match the value of purchases of their stock each month up to a value of 125 pounds, which is about $160. The purchases are taken from salary before tax, but need to be held a number of years before cashing in tax-free. Match shares can be lost if employees leave the company before maturity. Is this free money worth it? Or would it be better putting my money into a faster crypto horse? Well, there's many, many different dimensions to this, and it all depends as well on how fast the current company is, and probably not. And the amount is not that significant. But let's talk about golden handcuffs for a second. And a real story with me, I was receiving tens of thousands of stock options every year, four-year vesting schedule, and these stock options were worth way more than my salary. And that kept me in the same place for like 11 years. And that was a mistake because I lost a lot of opportunities to go other places uh, because I felt locked in. It's like, how can you walk away from seven digits in, in stock options when when you should really uh, be, be working for other companies? Anyway, this is the story of the golden handcuffs. Now, it's very, very common, especially in the tech industry, to drive retention. Sometimes you mentioned uh, the lockup schedule, simply four years vesting etc. But after you take out kind of the conversion price, the strike price, you pay taxes, you take into account the four-year vesting schedule, it's not as good or attractive as everything else that could be out there you could be missing on. And it's not a lot of money. So I would not bother. You know, if you're there and you're planning to stay there for three years, maybe you can get a little bit, you know, no, no harm in free money. But this is the best thing I believe to do is just ignore it um, ignore the handcuff benefits completely when evaluating a career. And this is the most important decision you can make. And they are designed to make you stop looking for better opportunities and cause you to make less optimal decisions. And, you know, I could go on and on, but obviously I do believe, let me just jump direct to my investment advice. I don't want to bore you to death with that stuff. But the key is, what are you worth? How much are you learning? How well is the company treating you and compensating you compared to what you could be earning on the outside or even earning for yourself? So this is my NCA, which is not career advice. It is <laughs> my career handbook. I just wrote this uh, not too long ago. But stay in each role at least two years because if you bounce around a lot, it can be frowned upon. If you leave a job every year, people look at that and they don't like that. So also it takes about two years to master your job. But don't stay more than three years in a role. And make sure you've exhausted all your learning by then. And make sure uh, as well that there is salary and compensation upside. Sometimes people join a company and their salary doesn't change for years and years. And always be looking. Keep your curriculum vitae, your resume up to date. And if you're not getting a 14% raise, bounce. That sounds a bit strong. <laughs> Who is getting a lot of people are getting 14% raises. Look what uh, they're doing to pension funds right now. They're increasing them way higher than ever before. Uh, labor unions are getting big indexes as well. So just use those as benchmarks and negotiate for an increased salary. But don't rock the boat. If your boss is not a good person and they don't have budget to increase salaries, uh, you could put yourself in jeopardy asking for too much. So be careful of that as well. Make sure 
first and foremost, if you need the job, you need the salary, make sure you, you keep it until you have your next stepping stone to jump to. So again, net net, golden handcuffs, be careful. They are there for a reason to lock you down. That's why they're called golden handcuffs. Next question is from Op Nico. Let's suppose you hit a big profit. How would you purchase a house? Full cash, minimum deposit, mortgage, if mortgage. What is the best way to not be indebted for life? So beautiful question uh, in my wheelhouse. So there are two ways to buy a house. First of all, advantages of buying a house with cash, limits need to pay interest on the loan as well as any closing costs. There is no mortgage origination fees, no appraisal fees, no lender's fees, etc. And also buying with cash is much easier, less paperwork, uh, less inspection, less appraisal, less underwriting, yada, yada, yada. And this comes very handy in terms of negotiation. If ever I'm buying a property, I have no contingencies. I do my own homework and I make an offer and I show that all the cash is there to do it. And that way, that way if I'm in a competitive situation with 10 other buyers, they'll choose me first because I have no contingencies. It's all cash. Nothing can get in the way of the deal. It's safe. It's a bird in the hand versus two in the bush, or in my case, 10 in the bush. Now, the other way, a little more difficult, is buy with a mortgage. And that is, it allows you not to tie up a lot of cash in the house, uh, etc. It frees up uh, some money for investing, maybe buying crypto or Tesla or something. But the downside is you need to end up paying more overall interest. Sometimes if there is a contingency for you to get the mortgage, that can give you a ding on the buyer process and the sellers may not choose you because of that. So let me tell you, if you do, back to your question, if you do have a stack of cash, this is the playbook that I think you should do. And in fact, we've got some people in the audience who are real estate experts. I wonder what they think about that. So first of all, if you have the cash, identify the property you want. Uh, make sure you have the time to buy, which is, I believe, the kill zone is kind of November 22 to January 2023. That's when I made most of my buying in my life. Use all cash to get a discount and get selected and a fast purchase. And then you refinance it. Okay, uh, so get the property first, nail it. Once you have it, then refinance it with the bank. Make sure you got very good credit. Make sure you got a very good relationship with a very flexible bank. And then pull the money out and invest the proceeds. And who knows, depending on the appraisal you get, typically the appraisal will actually give you the appraisal. It's like you've got to spend thousands of dollars on a guy to appraise your property. But they'll give you the same price you just paid for it and charge you thousands, which is such a ridiculous scam. But that's just me. Um, and no offense to any appraisers out there. Uh, but I've gone through so many, it's just ridiculous. Anyhow, that's what I would do. Use the cash, snipe the property, refinance it yourself, pull the money out. And in terms of the mortgages I like, which I've been preaching on this channel since I began a year and a half ago, interest only, at least 10 years fixed rate. And remember when you're borrowing money, even if you're paying right now 5% uh, for a 10 year fixed or four and a half, five, five and a half, depending on which bank you're working with, interest only, save all that money so you can invest and then pay your loan off with proceeds from maybe Bitcoin you bought or whatever. So that's the way I look at it. Next question. This goes back to our Bitcoin question before from Garlitz. If the US government bans Bitcoin, what happens if you move some from one wallet to another? If it's illegal and transactions are transparent, it can be traced to whoever sent it and received it, thus creating a liability. Interesting question. So let's tackle it first in a few ways. Uh, the US has tried to ban stuff in the past and many countries too. We'll talk a bit about a few, but trying to ban Bitcoin, we believe is futile. Uh, Bitcoin is digital and it can be self-custodied. Bitcoin holders can walk across borders with billions of dollars in Bitcoin in an encrypted file or in a piece of paper or memorized in their heads. Governments can't even control contraband. They can't even control contraband like illicit drugs in prisons, <laughs> which they run. So how are they supposed to ban Bitcoin? And that's one of the beauties of Bitcoin as well. One of the other reasons I love it. Non-confiscatable, can't be banned, etc. But the government tried to ban gold in 1933. Gold prices shot up 70%. Um, other examples, government tried to ban alcohol in the 20s. Yeah, it opened up a huge industry. And uh, I think today, um, things like alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, you name it. Anytime they try to ban something, 
it never really works. Let's look over some borders here as some, to some other bans. Um, China attempted to ban Bitcoin multiple times. Its recent attempt was banning Bitcoin mining. And a year after the Bitcoin uh, ban, China mining activity bounced back to become the second largest in the world. Now, we're still not sure if they're because of Chinese IP addresses, but we do know for a fact there is a lot of Bitcoin mining happening in rural areas of China that the government can't control. Um, then India passed a law banning Bitcoin in its country one year after the ban. India ranked second only behind Vietnam as the fastest growing cryptocurrency uh, country in adoption, according to chain analysis. And also, I think it has more than 50 million crypto investors today. Now, Canada tried to ban Bitcoin from getting into the hands of truckers during the trucker protests. And we all know how futile that was too. So won't get political, just talk about how difficult it is to ban this stuff. So if from that perspective, uh, I wouldn't worry. And there are many ways as well where you can, uh, I don't want to say, well, obfuscate your transactions. So uh, I wouldn't sweat it. And I do believe, um, and sometimes maybe I'm overly optimistic, but smarter heads will prevail within the US government, despite some of the stuff we heard last week. So next question is from Braggy. I hope I said that right. What is ISO 222 or 20,000 and zero two or 20022? And is it important when looking at tokens to invest in? Great question. So a quick recap for those who may not be aware of ISO 20022. It's a standard for data exchange between financial institutions. Uh, it reduces some of the frictions of transacting between institutions uh, that exist in SWIFT, for example. And it, it, it's just a standardization method for faster payment delivery. You know, think of all the stuff happening out of CBDCs. This type of standard will be a core component, I believe, going forward. But the other real thing is the, the key differentiator for ISO 20022 is it's going to allow for a huge amount of financial metadata to be shared across financial institutions with the central bank. And they'll have the ability to conduct potentially a lot of financial surveillance. They'll be able to track where the money came from, who it came from, how much they have, etc., where it's going, and they'll have a full kind of uh, chain behind it. And if anything, it's just a reminder of the importance of crypto and how you need to have sovereignty over your own money. This is so important. Now, back to your question. That's what it is. Who uh, is using it and are there tokens available? Well, this is an interesting list of players. So this ISO standard, these are members of the ISO 20022 standards body. They include XRP and XLM, which is Ripple and Stellar Lumens. And uh, in addition, there are three names that are actually compliant. That's Zinfin, IOTA, and Algorand are compliant. And rumored to be compliant, HBAR, Quant, and Cardano. Very interesting. Now, all of these, obviously, if you look at these names, their whole play around crypto space is not to build a layer one blockchain that's used by a billion users, but to be the infrastructure, perhaps guessing, to be a central bank digital currency infrastructure. And do I own any of these? Nope. Would I? Nope. Not my cup of tea, as they say. But of course, do your own research and anybody can invest in whatever they like. That's not my, uh, my, not my problem. We just share what we see and answer the questions we see. In addition, there's another piece here too. Um, there's some interesting stuff actually in researching this going on right now. Today, an article, there is supposedly an ETH-based crypto ruble coming. Russian CBDC or some type of variant thereof? We'll see. But that is what apparently the Russians are developing right now, an ETH-based token. I wonder, will it scale? Ah, so that was a big one. So a big thank you, everybody. Uh, today, we are helping animals. Um, this is the Animal Rescue Kharkiv, a group of volunteers who rescue animals 24-7 from the war zones in abandoned cities in Ukraine. And they are doing an amazing job. And thank you for everything that you do and helping us help them. And hope you enjoy the KPM today. So let's jump into some questions and uh, pop this up. Q&A time. And I hope the questions are here. And let me, let me see. 
one brought me back again. <laughs> Hope it's not another curveball. Uh, the last one was a tough one. Um, so how do you see Q4 this year and Q1 next year playing out? So many calling for disastrous end to the year. Also, any concern of slide after midterm? So uh, it, it's funny because, you know, I think I think we had, I'm not going to be accused of hope I'm here, but uh, I, I just look at what I believe are close to perfect bottoms and then go in hard. As I mentioned, I think the other day, you know, Tesla has gone up 50% in the last 90 days. Uh, June 16th, 2022, I believe was the bottom for the S&P 500. A few days before that was the bottom for crypto. It's very interesting that crypto actually leads it. Uh, Q4 historically is extremely good. Also, after the elections, if it does go into a lame duck session, it could be extremely good for the markets. Now, people like uh, Tom Lee and JP Morgan, etc., are all expecting very, very good Q4s uh, for the S&P to be like 4,500, 4,600, which could breach uh, the all-time high level. There are some that are expecting uh, big downturns. But again, I am cautiously optimistic. But at the same time, Q4, some people measure it by looking at the indexes. One thing I have to stress is I don't really care what an index does. Uh, it's like Bitcoin dominance. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. What matters is the components that you own. And that's critical. So I still remain very bullish on the assets that I am in. Uh, and whatever the stock market does will have an impact, but not that big an impact on things like Tesla. So um, no concern except midterms. I think if the Democrats remain in power to make more UBI decisions, maybe that'll cause more money printing, which could help Bitcoin go up. If they get taken out of power, um, the stock market typically, as per a previous video I did, typically does better when during a lame duck session than when a party has power. So we'll see where it goes. Um, that's it for now. But I am, if I was to guess before uh, year end 2022, Christmas, I believe will be higher from where we are now. So not lower, higher. And that's my bet. And that's how I am investing too. I put my money where my mouth is and I share everything I do transparently. Scoobs, 25. What is the threshold for UK interest rates before financial Armageddon? Yeah, it's, it's, it's well, UK, I, I did do the central bank video again a while back. I can add it here. Uh, and the focus point was the Bank of England because community, community members wanted to know about that. Uh, I think they can go quite a bit higher, but the new uh, prime minister is already money printing. Um, and I think they've also indicated that they would help homeowners in the UK so they wouldn't be penalized by any increase in rates. So it's like it's almost like a CBDC with multiple uh, interest rate kind of discrimination. Well, if you own a home, we're going to keep you at this rate. But if you are out on the streets, we're going to jack it for you and your credit card. I don't know what the situation may be. Um, but I think the UK, because their debt to GDP is about 100, which is going to go higher. It's going to go to 110 in the next year or so. Uh, but it's a lot less than the U.S. And therefore, they can with, withstand a little bit of a higher interest rate. Um, so uh, I think they can go <laughs> probably 4%. And after 4%, then it really will. That would be the equivalent of the Fed funds rate. I forget what they call it. I think it's called the gilt rate in the U.K. Um, if it goes to 4 or 4.5%, that could be a problem. Hope that helps, Scoobs. JKS. When you're speaking of getting your sol bag equal to your ETH bag, are you referring to your total capital investment into each or the current value? I'm talking about the current value. And I also take into account projections. So, so when I look at my current positions and if things go where I think they're going to go, my Bitcoin will be the smallest of my three <laughs> as we go forward. It's kind of interesting math. And I kind of hinted at that as well at the beginning. Although you go further out the risk curve, you got your 7, your 10, and your 20. That's kind of like the, the calculus I'm thinking about. It could be 7, 10, and 10. It could be 5, 7, and 10. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different uh, price prediction models, but that's where I'm going. So if I have, imagine I have, uh, say, $10,000 worth of ETH. I want to have $10,000 worth of 
Salama. And it, and then my future projections, which I do not share because I don't want people to get too excited, um, that helps me understand where I need to invest uh, less. And also during this downturn, and full disclosure as well, most of my money has gone into Solana and Tesla uh, during this downturn. All right, Ahmed, in your opinion, how much worse can the macro get? Inflation, recession, Ukraine, Fed hikes, stagflation. Uh, there is so much badness out there. <laughs> but the funny thing is, it's priced in and there's money on the sidelines that needs to be deployed. People that are paid to invest money can't sit on cash. And they're not paid uh, a big management fee to invest in silly things like T-bills or index funds. So when we look at the situation, global recession is coming. Typically, the market, uh, by the time the world knows recession is here and half the world still doesn't know. But once that happens, the market's already rebounding. Once the world will say, oh, we're in a recession, then the market's already on the way up again. Point number one. Point number two. Uh, things are looking very positive in Ukraine. You know, people like President Modi talking to Putin and Xi talking to Putin and kind of, you know, <laughs> clipping him across the back of the ear saying, come on, dude, stop this nonsense. That's positive inflation. We know it's a world of hurt. The central banks have limited power, but they once the central banks realize, OK, ladies and gentlemen, this recession is real. It's not an anomaly. It's real. Jacking rates into a recession hurts them, it hurts their deficits, it hurts GDP growth, and it'll spike unemployment. And that's kind of my thesis, and I'm hoping they see what I see. Uh, the indicators they're looking at are very old, but hopefully they're beginning to get better data to make better decisions. Next week will be pretty critical as to what the Fed does and what they say. I think it'll be 75 basis points, and that'll be the last big one from then It'll turn down maybe 50, maybe 25 after that. That's it. They can't do another 75 and another 75. That will smash housing market in the United States. It's already completely destroyed housing markets. If you check my real estate videos, you can see every single housing market across the globe is. And that makes up 30 to 40% of the domestic GDP in any country, especially in the US with home builders and stuff. So everything's factored in. Um, we're kind of at the bottom. Things are bad. Can they get much worse? I don't think so. So with that, we'll see. Money needs to be deployed. And Q4, I think, will be will the markets will be higher from where they are now by Christmas of this year. That's my take. I could be wrong. If they do spin us into financial Armageddon, it'll be like, I'll be like, God, <laughs> I thought these guys were smart. They're obviously really dumb. So that's uh that's my get out of jail free card. Cheryl L, deeply grateful for your generous offerings. You rock. Thank you, Cheryl. And Clint C, have a great week. You too, boss. Have a great week too. Encourage the cowardly dog. Let's lift the spirits. If you absolutely had to buy one meme stock and one meme crypto, what would it be and why? Not a bankruptcy advice, of course. Oh, uh, meme stocks. I would probably trade. Uh, i go short things like, um, I don't know. GameStop looks like, or Best Buy, uh, or Bed Bath & Beyond. Sorry, not Best Buy, Bed Bath & Beyond. One of those would be the stock. And Meme Crypto, um, again, uh, <laughs> I have one name, I won't mention it. Uh, I, I'd probably play with uh, Doge or Shiba. I mean, they're both ridiculous, but uh, when they go up, when they spike, when I track wallet movements, wall big wallets manipulating markets, then I would uh, strike. That's what I would do. And thank you for that NBA. Sounds like a basketball team, not bankruptcy advice. I love that. Bill Wammers, thank you so much uh, out there in Switzerland. I really appreciate you as well giving the team a heads up uh, about that fraudulent uh, group. So I appreciate you. How should we play Tesla next week? We have AI Day. AI Day, this is one I, I've been trying to for at least... 120 days now, trying to understand what it's going to do. Uh, Elon's been very quiet lately about it. He was very vocal about it a while ago. And that gives me pause, makes me think, oh, this might not be as exciting as we thought it would be. And therefore, I don't know. But if they have, like, I, I know what AI can do. I know what they have in the car. 
If they can just make a robot walk and lift a box and put it somewhere under a command from a human or from somebody from an audience, that would be a game changer. And that would get people really excited about Tesla, especially people who, who still don't understand that Tesla is not a car company, but people who paint it with that to say, oh, Tesla's like Volkswagen or BMW or something. It's like, no, 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 it's not at all. Um, so if, if, if the demo has one thing compelling that will show how robots can actually alleviate menial tasks from human beings, we should all get very excited. Uh, German, da, 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 da. let me see. Uh, thank you, German girl in Florida. Uh, no news on that one other than all the stuff that's already out there on the internet. And thanks for your super stickers. Well, Jeff Hammer, Artem Dog One, Bill Wammer, Scoobs, Adrian Gardner, German girl in Virginia, Miko Man, Jerry M27, and Green Candle. Let's hope we get a couple of good green candles next week. That would be nice. So with that, everybody, have a great weekend. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing. Two and a half thousand people, 630 likes. So one in four of you are liking the content. But I'll do you a deal. If you, if you learned something new today, which I guarantee you, you learned these three new things, hit the like. Thanks all. Have a good weekend. Bye.